Good morning, sunshine. Happy summer solstice. Funny story, while my new castle's being built, I needed a place to crash. And, well, easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, so I've been living in your main for the past year. It's really spacious in here, like TARDIS dimensions. But I figure I owe you rent, so how's about a video celebrating your best moments? I had a pinball I machine. Had a pinball I machine. Had a pinball I machine. Had a pinball machine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's no secret that Lauren Faust had plans for Celestia, namely to make her Queen Celestia. And though Hasbro required the princess title because someone made that term synonymous with money, the truth is that Celestia remains a queen in all but title. That includes her role in the story. Carl Jung, a psychologist and psychotherapist who took an interest in role model archetypes, sees the queen archetype as the caregiver for a whole nation. She is, in essence, mother to all. To quote Jungian.info, The queen slash mother aspect of a woman is a complex that has a personal relationship with her subjects and assumes the responsibility of providing an environment in which her subjects can thrive and flourish and find the relational qualities necessary for harmony to exist in the queendom. Her role will be to instill in her subjects the qualities that she, by her own sense of things, deems important. Her dedication to this labor forces her to surrender some aspects of her natural sensuality. She tends to be very supportive of social systems that provide an extended environment in which her children's or subjects are safe to explore and then return to her. She, of course, will sacrifice herself for her charges, for she has traded her individual path for the opportunity to be the creator and inspiration of her charges, who, in her creative side, she hopes will fulfill and surpass the dreams that she sacrificed to care for them. So, the accomplishments of her subjects become her fulfillment. Although I've had doubts about Celestia's presentation in the show at points, I do see her in this role. She's created a world in which ponies have the freedom to explore, to try new things, and to gather experience and shape relationships. Compare that to the rest of the world where some cultures are scrabbling just to survive or spend all their time competing for power. The problem is that when the spotlight falls upon Celestia, we see her at her worst. Her defeats, her failed plans, her backfired attempts. Or we see her as a manipulator rather than a loving parent. For me, the greatest moments for Celestia as a character are the moments where she is shown as more, for lack of a better term, human without being diminished. Starting with... <laughs> Did you ever expect to hear a sound like that from royalty? There have been moments where Celestia was surprised, or at least put off, but this is her most exuberant moment in the series. I do still feel that they were retreading story points from Season 1, but with far greater personality. This has been the most fun gala in years! It's one of those moments where we got to see beneath Celestia's calm and composure that she still has a wild side and playful spirit. Hopefully we can see more of that without ponies being threatened with extra-dimensional banishment next time. The night is still young! <laughs> And I bet the buffet was still open, so please, let her eat cake. Kinda funny that Celestia didn't technically appear in Ponyville Confidential beyond that photo. Yet this tidbit of info gave fans material for comics, artwork, and fanfics galore. It has no impact on her ability to lead, nor does it diminish her capabilities. It's just a character quirk that makes Celestia a little more real. The photo of her messily eating would set the stage for a brief appearance in Mystery on the Friendship Express, and help relay that even with 1,000 years experience, Celestia still has the energy and vitality to be a little silly. It's a fun contrast to her first appearance. Although Celestia had narrated the show's opening and set the stage for Twilight's quest, it isn't until the main six triumphed that the ruler they respected appeared. She was grand, she was luminescent, and you could see how much each of the ponies respected her. More than that, she reached out to Luna as an equal. We were meant to rule together, little sister. I often wonder how they talk to one another before Luna's fall. I imagine it would have been more like a sisterly spat. Nothing can ruffle a person more than family, even as something as simple as a forgotten gift can drive a wedge, though the bond shared can overcome that gap. This is one of only two instances where Celestia seemed to lose her cool, the other time being her storming out on Twilight. We also had Celestia and Luna disagree on how to rescue the Crystal Empire. Big difference between these scenes is the sense of right and wrong. Celestia was right about the Crystal Empire, right to be angry at Twilight's behavior, but wrong not to heed her warning. In this scene, it's not really a case of who is right or wrong. Both acknowledge that a forgotten gift isn't important enough to forget the love they share. 
and it's inspired by a demonstration of love that calls both to their better selves. I'm not asking that Celeste to be perfect in all things. I hope that instead her negative moments feel like an extension of her character and that they'll have an impact, just like her most painful memory. For my subjects, it has always been a celebration of my defeat of Nightmare Moon, but for me, it was just a terrible reminder that I'd had to banish my own sister. I try to imagine spending 1,000 years having to smile and celebrate a day that holds such bitter memories. Losing her sister to Nightmare Moon, banishing that sister and destroying their home, and then being hailed as a hero. I marvel that Celestia could look so composed or proud in Twilight's Cutie Mark flashback. But perhaps that's the biggest compliment to Celestia. She knew her subjects needed to look to the future with optimism, so she played her part. The moment she admits those feelings to Twilight, we get a sense that we are being included at a look behind her public persona and hopefully appreciate the demands of her station. I guess I'd never really thought about it that way. Seriously, Twilight? That never registered in your studies? There are times I get the feeling that Twilight hasn't gotten to see beyond Celestia's status or grandeur either. Although she's arguably closest after Luna, the bond they share always seems to be limited by student and teacher. Even their walk down memory lane seems to show more of Celestia's education for Twilight rather than mutual affection. Except for my favorite moment, when Celestia forgives Twilight. This might seem out of place given that we've had moments like Celestia's song in Magical Mystery Cure, Plus, there was an element of all's forgiven at the end of a Canterlot wedding. Big difference for me is Celestia's directness. While singing about Twilight's growth, Celestia doesn't really converse with Twilight about what the future means or what Twilight wants. It's clear that the path is already laid out. In a Canterlot wedding, Celestia praises Twilight but doesn't offer her own apology for failing to listen. But at the end of Lesson Zero, it's the one time I feel like Celestia has been straightforward with Twilight. There is no hidden lesson, no manipulation of conflict. Celestia has every right to be angry with Twilight for hexing the whole town and makes her take the long walk back to the library. Yet when it comes time for Twilight to face the consequences, Celestia says, You are a wonderful student, Twilight. I don't have to get a letter every week to know that. This is the moment where Celestia finally addresses Twilight as an equal, and it has the deepest meaning. Against a backdrop of so many engineered or opportunity-based lessons, or promises that Celestia will be there only to be abducted, a direct statement of fact shines. It's true that a parent has to step aside and let life happen for their charges to grow, much like Spike said at the end of the crystalline. But there's also times when a teacher or parent or even a ruler has to be upfront and address the issue directly. This is the biggest example of Celeste being both a caring guide and mentor without working behind the scenes. Not to mention open the door for the rest of the cast to write her letters for seasons two and three. So there are six examples of great moments for seeing Celestia as a character rather than just a title. And for more of that, I'd urge everyone to read The Princess Celestia Micro from IDW's comic line. All of the elements I listed here are on display in the comic, which remains my favorite presentation to date. Yet if you're wondering about her best moments as a leader, please consider the quote from earlier. The accomplishments of her subjects become her fulfillment. Rainbow Dash became a skilled flyer and moral teammate because she drew inspiration from the Wonderbolts, a team that Celestia founded. Applejack is a loving family member and community leader in a town that Celestia helped create. A fashion-minded pony from the same town was able to gain attention and recognition in Canterlot, thanks in part to Celestia's endorsement. Fluttershy was able to reform a chaos spirit and hold against peer pressure because she wanted to live up to Celestia's trust. Pinkie Pie can sing songs, arrange parties, and celebrate life in general because Equestria is at peace. We've seen how those celebrations disappear if war or strife overruns the country. And when both Starlight Glimmer and Sunburst are able to reconnect and reconcile, I have to wonder how Twilight learned about one of Celestia's former students having moved to the Crystal Empire. Celestia's presentation has not been perfect and there are a lot of points where I feel like her character has been undermined. Yet at the show's core, I do believe that she lives up to the role of leader and mentor. I hope we'll have the chance to see more of the Kyrian ruler and the personality behind the crown. I'm Silver Quill, thanks for watching.